Imagine standing on the shore of what was once a bustling port city. The water that used to lap at the docks now sits a kilometer away. Ships that once loaded cargo here are stranded, their hulls resting on dry land. This isn't some ancient civilization lost to time. This is happening right now at the Caspian Sea, and it's one of the most alarming environmental crises you've never heard about. But here's where it gets wild. While the Caspian Sea is literally disappearing, Russia, Kazakhstan, and potentially China are planning to spend over $20 billion to build one of the world's largest canals connecting this dying sea to the Black Sea. It's a project that could reshape global trade routes, shift the balance of power across an entire continent, and either become a modern engineering marvel or the most expensive mistake in history. Now, the Caspian Sea holds a distinction that sounds impressive until you understand the problem. It's the world's largest inland body of water, containing massive reserves of oil, natural gas, and surrounded by nations that produce enormous quantities of grain. Kazakhstan alone is one of the top wheat exporters on the planet. Turkmenistan sits on some of the world's largest natural gas reserves. Russia's southern regions produce millions of tons of cargo every year. But all of this wealth, all of these resources are trapped. The Caspian has no natural connection to the ocean. Every single shipment that leaves this region has to go through someone else's territory to reach global markets. For decades, there's been only one maritime route available, a relic from the Soviet era called the Volga Don Canal. Built back in 1952 under Stalin's rule, this canal is laughably inadequate for modern trade. It's only 3.5 meters deep. That's barely enough for small cargo ships. Modern vessels, the kind that move serious freight across oceans, need at least double that depth. The canal can only handle ships around 5,000 tons, while today's standard cargo vessels easily exceed 10,000 to 15,000 tons. Traffic crawls through this bottleneck. It's seasonal, heavily regulated, and costs exporters billions every year in delays and inefficiencies. For a region sitting on resources worth trillions, this single outdated waterway has shaped the economic reality of five nations for over 70 years. Kazakhstan felt this limitation more than anyone. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, Kazakhstan suddenly found itself independent. With vast territory stretching across Central Asia, energy wealth that could fuel nations, and strategic geography that put it at the crossroads of Europe and Asia. But it had no coastline. President Nursultan Nazarbayev understood that this geographical reality was holding his country back. He envisioned a future where Kazakhstan could reach the sea without begging for permission, without paying transit fees, without being at the mercy of neighboring countries' political whims. By 2007, Kazakhstan officially proposed something ambitious to Russia build a deep water canal that could finally give the Caspian region true access to world markets. The timing was critical. China had just launched the Belt and Road Initiative, a massive plan to rebuild the ancient Silk Road through modern infrastructure, railways, pipelines, and ports connecting Asia to Europe. A new canal linking the Caspian to the Black Sea fit perfectly into this vision. It aligned three major powers in a way few projects could. Russia would modernize its crumbling Soviet infrastructure. Kazakhstan would gain the maritime independence it desperately wanted. China would secure another corridor for westward trade, strengthening its position in Eurasia. The proposal should have moved forward quickly. But decades passed with nothing but feasibility studies and political discussions. And now, there's a reason why the urgency has suddenly intensified, and it's not what you'd expect. While politicians debated and engineers drew plans, something catastrophic started happening to the Caspian Sea itself. It began shrinking. Not slowly, not gradually, but at an alarming rate that scientists didn't fully anticipate. Like the water level has been dropping about 7 to 10 centimeters every single year. That might not sound like much until you realize this has been happening for decades. Projections now suggest the Caspian could fall another 9 to 18 meters by the end of this century. The northern basin, where Kazakhstan's major ports are located, could effectively disappear within 75 years. Cities like Aktau, which were built as coastal ports, are already watching the waterline retreat. Ships can't dock where they used to. Harbors are becoming unusable. In some areas, the sea has lost nearly half its water coverage since the year 2000. Climate change plays a role, but there's more to it. 
Russia's extensive dam systems on the Volga River have drastically reduced freshwater inflow into the Caspian. The sea has no outlet, so it relies entirely on rivers feeding it. When those rivers are dammed and diverted, the sea shrinks. What's emerging is a race against time that nobody planned for. If the canal gets built, it might connect to a sea that's vanishing. The ports it's meant to serve could be sitting on dry land before the project is even finished. This adds a layer of urgency and absurdity to the entire plan. They're building a canal to a disappearing sea. So what exactly would this canal look like if they actually built it? The proposed route follows a natural geological corridor called the Kuma Manich Depression, stretching roughly 700 kilometers across southern Russia. This low-lying valley is one of the only viable paths for such a waterway, avoiding the mountains and extreme elevation changes that would make construction nearly impossible. Engineers plan to dig at 6.5 to 7 meters deep, allowing ships between 10,000 and 15,000 tons to pass through. That's almost triple the capacity of the outdated Volga Don Canal. Annual cargo volume could reach 75 to 100 million tons, putting this waterway in the same league as some of the busiest shipping routes on Earth. Ports across the Caspian, Aktau in Kazakhstan, Turkmenbashi in Turkmenistan, Astrakhan in Russia, would suddenly have direct access to the Black Sea. From there, ships could navigate through Turkey's straits into the Mediterranean and reach every major market on the planet. For landlocked Central Asia, this isn't just an upgrade, it's a complete transformation. A closed sea would become a global trade hub, but building this thing would be an absolute nightmare. Constructing a canal this size rivals the engineering challenges of Suez or Panama. Millions of cubic meters of earth would need to be excavated. Massive concrete structures would rise across hundreds of kilometers. Entire towns, railways, pipelines, and road networks would need to be built or expanded just to support the construction effort. But here's the killer problem. The Caspian Sea sits 28 meters below sea level. The Black Sea doesn't. Water won't naturally flow along this route. Engineers would have to build an intricate series of locks and pumping stations to manage water levels and regulate flow. Similar to how the Panama Canal operates but adapted for longer, heavier cargo vessels moving through a region with vastly different geography. The soil itself presents another challenge. Much of the terrain along the route is dry and prone to erosion. Without extensive reinforcement, the canal banks could collapse. Salinization could destroy surrounding farmland. The project would require water balancing basins, irrigation management systems, and environmental safeguards that add billions to the cost. Modern navigation systems would be installed, allowing two-way traffic with real-time tracking. At peak construction, tens of thousands of workers would be deployed across multiple fronts. Estimates suggest the project would take 10 to 15 years to complete, assuming everything goes perfectly. And nothing ever goes perfectly with projects this big. The real obstacle isn't engineering, though, it's money. A project estimated at over $20 billion doesn't just require funding, it requires political will, international cooperation, and confidence that the investment will pay off. Russia is interested, but its economy is under severe strain from sanctions and a costly war in Ukraine. Kazakhstan supports the canal, but can't bankroll it alone. That leaves China as the most likely investor. Through state banks and belt and road partnerships, China has the financial muscle and construction expertise to make this happen. Chinese companies have built mega projects across Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. They know how to move earth, pour concrete, and deliver infrastructure on this scale. But even China is cautious. Geopolitical tensions are rising. Alliances are shifting. The return on investment for a canal that might take decades to become profitable isn't guaranteed. And then, there's the elephant in the room. Even if the canal gets built and even if it works perfectly, there's still one country that controls whether ships can actually reach the rest of the world. Turkey. No matter how much money gets poured into this canal, Turkey remains the ultimate gatekeeper. Every ship that exits the Black Sea must pass through the Bosporus and Dardanelles Straits to reach the Mediterranean. Turkey controls those straits under the Montreux Convention, an international agreement from 1936 that gives Turkey the right to regulate maritime traffic. If Turkey decides to limit passage, charge higher fees, or restrict certain types of cargo, the entire canal becomes far less valuable. 
Turkey has even proposed building its own canal, the Istanbul Canal, which would bypass the Bosporus entirely and give Turkey even more control over Black Sea access. The geopolitics don't stop there. Iran and Azerbaijan are watching this project nervously. Both worry that a new canal would increase Russia's influence over Caspian trade even further. If Russia controls the canal and Turkey controls the straits, then Central Asia's access to global markets still depends on the goodwill of powerful neighbors. Kazakhstan wants independence, but this canal might just trade one form of dependence for another. China's involvement adds another layer of complexity. If Chinese money builds this canal, does that give China leverage over the region's trade routes? Does it strengthen China's belt and road strategy while making Russia and Kazakhstan economically reliant on Beijing? These aren't small questions. They're the kind of considerations that make investors nervous and politicians hesitant. Then there's the environmental backlash, and it's growing louder. Diverting rivers and altering natural waterways at this scale can wreck ecosystems that took millennia to develop. Fish migration routes could be permanently blocked. Wetlands that support countless species could dry up. Salt levels in the water could shift, destroying farmland and accelerating desertification in a region already facing serious environmental stress. Planners insist they'll build artificial reservoirs, controlled flow gates, and fish passages designed to protect wildlife. But history isn't kind of promises like that. When humans alter water systems on this scale, the consequences are unpredictable and nearly impossible to reverse. The Aral Sea, not far from this region, is a haunting reminder of what happens when water management goes wrong. Once one of the world's largest lakes, it shrank to a fraction of its size after Soviet planners diverted rivers for irrigation. Entire fishing communities collapsed. Toxic dust storms now blow across the dry seabed. The environmental disaster is still unfolding decades later. Critics of the Eurasia Canal fear a similar outcome, just on a different scale. If the canal disrupts water flow, damages ecosystems, or accelerates the Caspian shrinking, the cost could far outweigh any economic benefit. And once the damage is done, there's no going back. As of 2025, the Eurasia Canal remains stuck in the planning phase. Detailed engineering studies continue. Negotiations drag on. Funding hasn't been secured. Political agreements haven't been finalized. If everything aligns perfectly, construction could begin in the late 2020s, Dos, with completion sometime in the 2030s or 2040s. But that's a big if. Russia's focus is consumed by the war in Ukraine. China is weighing its options carefully, unwilling to commit until the geopolitical situation stabilizes. Kazakhstan is building up its own naval capabilities, taking advantage of Russia's distraction to assert more control over Caspian waters. Meanwhile, the sea itself keeps shrinking. Some analysts argue the canal is outdated before it's even built. Oil and gas increasingly move through pipelines, not ships. Global trade routes are shifting. Renewable energy is reducing dependence on fossil fuels. Is this a forward-thinking investment or a relic of 20th century thinking being pushed into a 21st century world that's already moving on? Supporters insist the canal could transform the region for centuries. Just as Suez and Panama transformed global trade, it would create jobs, stimulate economies, and give Central Asia the maritime access it has lacked for its entire modern history. But critics see a politically driven fantasy, a prestige project that serves nationalist ambitions more than economic necessity. If this canal ever gets built, it would stand as one of the greatest engineering achievements in human history. It would reshape trade networks, redefine regional power dynamics, and open the landlocked heart of Eurasia to the sea. But right now, it's a bold idea suspended between ambition and reality. A vision that might save a region or might become another cautionary tale about hubris and miscalculation. The clock is ticking. The Caspian Sea is shrinking. Political tensions are rising. And the question isn't just whether this canal can be built. It's whether it should be built and whether there's still time for it to matter. One thing is certain, if they move forward, the world will be watching. Because a project this big doesn't just change trade routes, it changes everything. 